So this is like the use case um, we have do in our ecosystem. And in the future, what we are trying to build is because we have more time to build our own stuff, we get rid of the operations. Um, so we are trying to build our own platform that truly self-service Elasticsearch to our customers. That engineer don't even need to log in Elasticsearch to do things. They can most of the work can be done directly into our platforms. From there, we solve the problems of access, we solve the problem of audit, security, and all the data facilities. So I think this presentation is not sharing that what is the best practice for ecosystem in startup company. Instead, as Grab, we grow step by step. Uh, we are telling a story that actually happens in the company in Southeast Asia and what's the decision we make based on the resources and the situation that we have at that scenario. I hope it helped in your use case as well and make your life easier as well. And all the important and, and the most important part to get more people to know about Elasticsearch is a great product and make their search experience better and their life easier. Thank you, I want to hand back to Paul. Thanks, Ben. Hey, really appreciate uh, you sharing Grab's journey with Elastic. Um, you know, I've heard it over the past few years. Love to see how you've evolved deployment options, how you've moved to ECE and removed that operational overhead so you can focus on innovation and love that we're a part, um, you know, of your stack. Um, so thank you for sharing the journey. Um, now we are going to patch in around the world. Uh, we have a colleague who's, it's almost Tuesday for him, but not quite. Uh, he's patching in from the Washington DC area and he is our product lead for security. So please welcome Mike Nichols. Mike, you there? I am, thanks so much. And I, I really appreciate you all having me here to talk about uh, Elastic Security. So as Paul mentioned, I'm Mike Nichols. I'm the product lead for the Elastic Security team. And uh, I'm officially a time traveler because as Paul mentioned, it's actually still the 22nd for me and yet it's the uh, afternoon of the 23rd for you. So I feel uh, I feel very privileged to come speak to, to your region about what we're building here at Elastic and uh, and really talk, talk a lot about the fact that we're building a lot of these capabilities out of the box now in these solution areas. Now you, you heard some previous ones earlier today, uh, like observability enterprise search and security is the third pillar of our sort of out of the box solution centric approach to Elastic. So as you just heard from that really fantastic customer conversation with Grab, you know, you can really make Elastic whatever you need. I mean, we, we solve a, a ton of use cases in a really amazing way for people just by being powerful and it's really being the best search engine out there. Uh, but my solution, the, the goal we have is to make an out of the box experience on security so that you don't have to do any additional configurability to it whatsoever. It just works for you to protect your enterprise. And we're gonna talk about that uh, here today. So, you know, to be start with, I don't think uh, I'm going to say anything too controversial uh, to what you already expect. But, you know, so my background uh, before I was here, I was the VP of product at a company called Endgame, which is an endpoint security company that provided uh, enterprise protection software or anti malware and, and sort of anti uh, attack uh, protection. And before that, I was a defender. I spent my time uh, in US Army intelligence and also in many different uh, security operation centers uh, defending the world from attack, right? Defending uh, us from these cyber adversaries. And so I had my hands on tons of different systems constantly, uh, network systems and, and uh, you know, endpoint and, and your, your sims and everything else. Uh, and I always faced the same challenge, no matter where I was. I could be at a massive government uh, place with more people than you can imagine, or I could be at a small startup. And the challenges were always the same. And the, really the first one in the, in the core of Elastic Capabilities is that uh, the, the, the attack surface is just massive, right? That we, we can't just look for sort of the known areas and collect just that data because adversaries are constantly evolving to collect new or, or to attack new areas that we aren't looking at. Uh, if you follow something like the MITRE attack matrix, it's a really fantastic taxonomy that allows you to understand all these different areas across every operating system or the major operating systems that an adversary would exploit. And the challenge is a lot of the times they look like you and me, they look like the typical user. So that data is extremely important to collect. Uh, but most systems out there either are economically uh, out of reach to, to secure it. So you can think of some of our competitors in the SIM space, for example, that 
are uh, almost, uh, I'll, I'll call it predatory in their pricing model where it doesn't allow you to store that data uh, or you can't actually action it. If you store it in sort of a big, large database and create a data lake or a data ocean, it's not actionable. Your security analyst can't get information out of it. So because of that technical and economic reasons, uh, you have blind spots in the information. You can't action the data quick enough. Uh, the second big problem is that, of course, everyone has to worry about this. This isn't a geo problem or a vertical problem or a uh, size of you know sort of market segment problem. Every single person from the single person startup at their house uh, to the massive enterprise has to worry about this because uh, now that attacks are online, they can hit anybody anywhere. And so I think the, the news has shown you, right, that everybody is a target and it's a pretty challenging world out there. Uh, and, the, and the last one, I think it's no surprise to anybody that it's really, really hard to find people to do this job. Uh, I know that uh, when I was both in the military and then out of the military, it was a uh, it was a you know a, a job that was in a deficit constantly. It still is. I think it's hundreds of thousands of people are still needed to fill the role of a cybersecurity world. Uh, and so, how do you find those people? How do you train them? How do you retain them? Uh, and then, what happens if you're constantly shoving new products in? Because if anyone's gone to a major security conference, you know, every day every there's a new hallway filled with hundreds of new vendors trying to take your money, and it's like a uh, sort of these products that mask or these, these, these sort of features that masquerade as products and products that masquerade as companies, you know, these niche solutions uh, that you need to shove one more thing, yet another thing on your endpoints or yet another thing in your network to solve some minuscule problem. And when really what you want is a consolidated place to solve those features and make it simple enough for anyone to operationalize. And that's where Elastic enters, right? I mean, that's our job. I think at the beginning of this, uh, the crux of it is data. You know, security is ultimately a data problem. I need that, that full amount of data in my environment to know what happened, and I need to action it fast enough to collect, connect those dots to either prevent the problem or build that narrative so I can respond to the problem. And Elastic has that capability to provide actionable, uh, you know, uh, response on information faster than anybody else at a, at a thing that's both technically and economically uh, feasible. We can do it at scale because my solutions uh, team provides out of the box capabilities. And we'll show you that today in a demonstration. We don't just give you the technology and say, good luck. We actually put the fuel into the engine. We give you the content, the out of the box rules, the out of the box models, uh, the analyst workflow, all available there so that you can put this directly into your security operations center or into your IT team, wherever it might be. And then in a way to arm every analyst, we're trying to build a simplified workflow. We are constantly iterating with an experienced user experience team to ensure that we, you know, we have a product that is simple to use, it's intuitive. And our goal is actually to empower every analyst. That doesn't say security analyst. That means that your SRE team, your, uh, your help desk manager, whoever is an analyst in your team could actually pivot quickly into security because it's an intuitive interface and it's built into the same product. Uh, if you heard earlier from observability, uh, the same interface that, a, that an SRE user is using for, for example, tracking uptime can then pivot and directly find a problem and then open a ticket into, into Jira, for example, in the security solution. So it's a really seamless experience uh, for our users. And what we're providing is that unified protection. I think that the most phenomenal thing is that it's available for everyone. You know, we were really democratizing security. Uh, you know, when I was in security as a defender, uh, it was almost like a classes system where it was so expensive for enterprise security that you had, you know, the sort of line drawn where anyone below the line was just ripe for attack because they couldn't protect themselves with the, with the best technology out there. And Elastic has really just dissolved that whole line. They provided uh, the, 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 the same use case that we have today available free for everyone in an open way, which means that everyone has access to this phenomenal protection. We can really truly uh, attack our vision, which is to protect the world's data from attack. And I think that's really phenomenal. And, and again, I'll reiterate a few times today, but please you know, go and, and check us out at elastic.co. You can actually download the product, get a 14 day free trial in the cloud and try this out right now. So with that, let me, uh, let me pivot into a demo and kind of show you a little bit about what I'm talking about. So if you're not familiar with the security solution, uh, this is what we have here today. I'm, I'm landing here on the overview page. So uh, this is when you first land in, you're an analyst, you start your day, you, you log in, you wanna see what's happening. And the overview page provides a few different things that I think are really exciting. The first, of course, is just a, a, an overview of the active information for health and status. And one thing I think that we're gonna say a few times today is that you know Elastic is an open uh, product, right? And, and I think that's that means uh, uh, kind of the core of our philosophy here. You'll see a slide later that we integrate with anyone, you know, every single person that you just heard grab earlier that everything they need to be sort of plugged in uh, with our product. And so we can ingest 
almost anything. I mean, we have a huge amount of connectors out of the box. If you haven't seen elastic.co slash integrations, you can see a huge list of the, of the things that work out of the box today. But we also released a thing called Elastic Common Schema, which is a normalization framework that lets us put any data instantly into this normalized uh, technology or normalized framework for the system. And what that means is we well, can write a rule one time you know, I want to do something like find this bad IP address. I write that rule one time. And no matter what underlying technology I have, if I change out my firewall, my IPS, my router, whatever it is, it doesn't matter because when it's normalized once, it then works constantly. So you write once and use infinitely across your environment. It's really a powerful technology that allows us to ingest all that information. But also, I think it's pretty cool. We have this on the left-hand side, a security news feed. And this is where we get to touch our users directly. It allows us to uh, interact with our users, provide information. Of course, we also have our discuss forums, our public Slack channels, and other places where the, the community can talk to us directly. Uh, but here, it allows us to put news that matters directly into our analyst hands. I think, you know, in classical security products, you sort of have that dividing line where the support emails are only with the certain people. And I know as an analyst, I was always like, well, is there an update out today? I, I don't know what's going on. I had to ask four different people up the chain. And here we just talk directly to you because there is no uh, so delineation. Our users are directly contacted to our company, which I think is pretty awesome. Let me jump into a day in the life. So I'm going to go into our detections page here and, uh, and, and kind of talk about what we have. So, of course, in our detections page is what you'd expect to sort of a uh, list of different types of things we can find. Uh, but the first thing I want to point out is that if I go here to our, our rules, you don't have to make these things. And I think this is really critical. You are not asked on day one to say, hey, show up and provide information. We have over 120 plus rules out of the box that just work for you that are all mapped to the MITRE attack framework. And if you're not familiar with MITRE, uh, MITRE is a federally funded research and development center in the U.S., and what they've done is they've collected information about how different adversaries attack operating systems like Mac, Windows, Linux, and they build a taxonomy that goes into a lot of depth. So if you're familiar, for example, with the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain with those seven steps, imagine taking those seven steps and then breaking them down in, in really deep detail on actually how an adversary could attack that system. And we now map our detections directly to that. So there's a few things there. One, you get an instant uh, ability to analyze your security posture. You can tell the coverage you have in your environment based on how well you're covered across that matrix. And two, uh, it's an easy way for your analysts that might be new to learn. So if they get a detection for something, for example, and they say, well, I don't really know what this is, they can click and to go directly to the MITRE's website. And MITRE basically has like a big wiki where you can read in depth about what happened, what adversaries are using it, and just learn a ton about that. Uh, and so it's a really easy way for you to up-level your analyst team. So for example, let me just jump into one of these rules. I don't know, I'll grab like uh, Windows scripting is a good example. I'll jump into this one. So again, the rules we ship out of the box, uh, we provide uh, the information that maps directly to MITRE. I'll show you that here in a second as it pops in. Uh, but another thing that's really critical about Elastic is to remember, we're an open company, right? We don't hide what we do. Many uh, security companies you might deal with, uh, they might behind the trade secret problem. Oh, I can't tell you about that, it's a secret. You know, or, or a trust us, I promise you it's gonna work. But how do you really invest your security risk? How do you really uh, say that you're, you're, you're able to sort of accept that without knowing exactly what's happening? Well, for us, everything is out in the open. Here's exactly how our queries are written. We actually have them also documented. You can go in and look at our documentation and see every rule and how exactly it's written. So you can make the assessment for yourself on if this actually protects you. And then of course you can edit, you can modify, you can change. You can see here how it maps directly to MITRE. So if I wanted to learn about spear phishing, I can click here and it's gonna go directly to MITRE to learn more. But something else that's really cool is that we also said, you know, I know that as much as I love the interface, because of course it's my product, <laughs> I know that you probably don't want to live in a product all day. So you can take any one of these rules you think are really highly actionable and you can instantly create an action here that says, hey, every time it fires or once a day, once an hour, whatever it might be, I can instantly send that out to a suite of systems, a generic webhook to go anywhere, email, Slack. And all you have to do is just say, oh yeah, I want to send it to Slack. We have, an, we have a way to put in these sort of pre-built variables. So it says, hey, here's where you go add that action. And now anytime that triggers, it's going to hit me on Slack so I can get my, you know, my phone, for example, and see what happened, as opposed to having to sit in the interface all day. So a really easy way to sort of manage your security risk without having to live inside of a security product, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, so let me go back for a second into the actual detections and, and talk about really, you know, what we're looking at and give you an example there. So you know, when I'm looking here, of course, the next question is, well, what, what do you do, right? I see alerts. I want to know what's happening. 
Well, one thing, and I'll show you just a quick one because I don't have a whole lot of time today, but I'll give you a great example. You know, again, when I was an analyst, we had a thing we called super timeline, which was just an Excel spreadsheet with a big macro in it. And what we would have to do whenever we thought a problem existed. So let's say I look at this and I say, you know what, man, this James box, he's listed here a lot. This isn't too great. Uh, I would have to go on the James box and suck all those windows logs off at a point in time on a very slow process. And then once I got them, I'd shove them into an Excel spreadsheet. I'd run a macro against them. I'd try to stack them into sort of the story, right? To get the narrative of what happened. Well, because Elastic is always collecting all that information using the suites of either your data collections or we have technologies like our beats and our endpoints that will go get that, that data for you automatically. We have that all, all that data constantly. It's very easy for us to build that narrative. All you need to do is, is create what we call a timeline. So I'm going to take James here and I'm going to say, you know what? I want to learn more about him. I'm going to drag him over to the timeline. And now what I'm doing is I'm creating a live interaction, interactive investigation that instantly pops up everything in that time window that I was looking at that has to do with his system. And you'll notice it isn't just, we might see in other systems, which is like raw JSON do you like this? That, that's, you know, I'll call it interesting, but not useful. We have what we call event rendered view which actually takes that all that raw data and puts it into a narrative that an analyst can understand. So here you say, oh, this guy, James, uh, on his box, started a process called PowerShell, interesting. Uh, it used this thing called bypass and exec, well, that's kind of weird from WScript. You know, it's kind of walking through exactly what happened. If you go slowly down here, you'll find, we tell you how much data was sent and where and to who, uh, you know, there's, there's DNS requests. I mean, you can see all kinds of different things here. For example, like this guy's going out to withyourface.com. Lots of really interesting pieces that are kind of telling that narrative here. I can name this thing, for example, you know what, like uh, interesting user. I can put a description in if I wanted to. Lots of ways I can add notes. I can even comment in line here. Uh, but one of the coolest things I can do is I can pivot back and go, you know what, let me give you more information about, about that system. I can go actually into James's detailed view. And here you'll notice we actually also run some machine learning jobs. It might not be high enough level. Of course, we're gonna we're gonna alert you if they're bad, right? We have a threshold where we're actually alert you, and you can modify it if you want. But this one, for example, fell below the threshold, but I still have data about what happened. I still see that oh man, WScript's running something. That's really interesting. So we're telling you there's something unusual is happening on the system. There's some usual logins that are happening. I can actually find other things like uncommon processes. You know, and now I know enough to say ah, you know this is this is interesting enough to to go deeper. I'm going to go here and actually start a case. I'm going to attach this timeline to a new case. And now it's going to create our, jump into our cases interface, which is really the place for us to collaborate with our peers. I'm going to name this, you know, uh, James user investigation. I'm going to put a tag in here, like, you know, user. And, uh, and then I'm going to hit create case. What happens now is it takes this, uh, it uses markdown language to create this as a new link. Uh, this goes directly to that timeline. Now, if I want to add more comments, I can. I can go in here and, and type them out if I want to. I can, you know, have my 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 team could do that as well. And if I want to actually push this to a third party system, we have cases integration with people like ServiceNow with Jira. So you can actually take this and push this incident into another ticketing system to then investigate further. Uh, so there's a whole lot more we can do, and I, and I don't want to, you know, I could definitely talk a lot more about all the different power we have here inside of this. But I'm hoping what you see here is a pretty simple uh, way to find a threat, investigate a threat, collaborate on a threat, and then push it to a third-party ticketing remediation solution. And again, I want to reiterate, this is using ECS, the Elastic Comma Schema in the backend. So what that means is, you know, in this case, you notice the detections, those things came in via, I think it was Sericata was, was this one. Uh, or Sysmon data, but it could also come in via, uh, you know, uh, Sericata's, you know, Zeek, uh, you know, CrowdStrike, Endgame, you know, you name it, doesn't matter. Uh, that rule was written once and will work on any of those systems. And what that means is you've now sort of consolidated your need to have many, many vendors uh, in the system. And you've, you've, you haven't locked yourself into one vendor. You know, part of the problem with some of these kind of platform play uh, companies is that you get locked into their endpoint and their network proxy and their firewall. And the products don't work that well if they're not combined together. Uh, but because Elastic is an open company that's core, it doesn't matter who you decide to put onto the endpoint or who you put in the network. Of course, we think our products are best, <laughs> but if you decide you wanna change it out, go ahead. The fact that you put all this investment into that, that SIM use case here, into this, uh, you know, people are calling this now sort of the XDR, or the everything detection response use case, uh, that doesn't get wasted. All you do is write one translation or, or you probably have it out of the box for you in ECS, and instantly all that becomes available for you. So it's really a great way to up-level a conversation and to, uh, you know, be able to tell your, your boss or your boss's boss, like, hey, you know, we haven't locked ourselves into anything. We still can change out the uh, underlying end technology if we have to, because we built ourselves in sort of our foundational system is elastic. You know, the thing that we actually can action on that information is elastic.
you know, when I noticed, I'm not even show you this here, part of the drag and drop pieces in the timeline is you can actually say, you know, make it more nuanced. You can say, you know what, I want to actually also add, let's say, for example, this IP address and drop it in here as an and, and boom, it comes, it comes back. And you see how fast that is. I mean, if I take this off, it's going to come back and give me the answer. It went across 65,000 plus records. You know, this thing goes, I've seen it go across, you know, millions of records, uh, you know, instantly as well. Imagine this kind of power to be able to dig through your data and get these sort of real time data manipulations and data analysis. This is things I could never do as an analyst before in a really simple way. All right, so let me pivot back for a second uh, into the, the slide deck, but definitely if there's any questions, I'll be jumping into Q&A, uh, the, the Q&A that came in uh, later on and answering you uh, sort of at a cycle here. But let me jump back into the conversation on the slide deck here kind of tell you what you just saw. So what I was showing you there is, again, one solution, one interface, one workflow for prevention, detection, and response, all built on top of Elastic. And I think that to, the thing to remember is that Elastic gives you the ability to instantly action that data, no matter where the data comes in from and no matter who it is, give us all your data, doesn't you know, put it in one place, and then you can actually action that instantly like we were just showing you. That same workflow I showed you could be applied to any single data. Imagine if you can get insights like that instantly across any data you have, what, you know, what your InfoSec team would say. And you know, I wanna talk a little bit about our history because if you talk to, uh, you can actually go to our website, look at use cases, you'll find major, major brands using us for security today. And it's because they knew that our, the power of our uh, underlying search technology was the best solution for their info, InfoSec team. And even though the security solution, the same application is relatively new uh, from an Elastic standpoint, you know, we've had a rich history of delivering these security specific use cases. And again, I urge you to go to the website. There's a, a whole customer section where you can read a lot about different customers that have used us uh, in the past. And ultimately, you don't just get the security solution, right? What I demoed for you was a solution, but if you go back, you know, just a, a, a two talks ago to the enterprise search or, or observability talks, remember that's all built on the same platform as well. The power of the fact that we're built all on the Elastic stack, Elastic Search and Kibana, is that your user could be in the security application now. And if that analyst needed to help out, for example, the SRE team, they could pivot directly into the observability tab instantly if they had access to that. And what that means is, you know, as we're seeing the lines blur a lot, you see things like, you know, security teams having to uh, monitor the configuration changes of AWS files, for example, you know, somewhat an observability story, somewhat a security story. Or you see as uh, Bitcoin mining gets more popular uh, on servers, you know, you see a high CPU utilization on a server that an SRE member might notice as, as an uptime problem. But then when they dig in at root cause analysis and find out an adversary is there that has installed a mining system, well, that becomes a security problem. So that handoff is really, really easy now because that analyst can either do the same job or talk to their friend on the same application and pass it over. Imagine your uptime team uh, pulling that into a case and then adding a comment and the security team picking that up from that same exact case interface and then pushing that case to Jira, for example, to then remediate. Which kind of uh, solves the problems that a lot of developers have have, uh, have been facing or, or challenges that they have been facing for solving different kind of problems, and also not just that, but uh, how uh, the in in Elastic Stack, whatever changes we make to Elastic Stack, new features we add to Elastic Stack, how they get propagated to the three solutions that we spoke about today. Uh, Jonas spoke about Elastic Search, where we have introduced Workplace Search recently, along with Site Search and App Search. Asabri mentioned about uh, observability and what exciting new things we are doing with observability and uh, obviously, just now uh, Mike spoke about security solutions as well. So today I'm going to cover uh, different new improvements that we are bringing in, that we have brought into the whole stack, basically Elasticsearch and Kibana, which easily gets propagated to the three solutions and obviously to the entire stack as well. So uh, people who are building their own platform can benefit all of those features and enhancements that we build in. Uh, a quick chat, uh, a quick note about uh, those people who joined in late. We have a Q&A button on Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop a note. Uh, some of my colleagues are monitoring your questions and they'll be happy to answer them. We also have some time uh, dedicated for uh, Q&A at the end and we'll uh, try to cover some questions during that session as well. Now, uh, getting back to the topic, uh, uh, our approach to adding new features or new uh, enhancements to the stack. Uh, earlier, it used to be a simple platform uh, where uh, developers used, used to build different solutions 
like it became the most popular threat hunting platform even before we introduced uh, the seam app or uh, it was very popularly used as, uh, as for log analytics or monitoring or geospatial analytics even before we had launched those solutions so we are building and adding new and new features to the stack but along with that uh, we are also encoding best practices uh, to the stack as well so that uh, they are available in ready to use solutions you don't have to build a separate platform say for threat hunting or for monitoring or for uh, building uh, a search interface for your application for your web page uh, we are building ready to use solutions and we are adding new 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 best practices easier to use uh, features which are embedded inside the solutions that we are offering now so it's it's not just a simple open source platform now it's more like multiple solutions ready to use turnkey solutions which are, which are available to you uh, ready to use tool set which is available to you for different use cases uh, on the stack front uh, today we are going to talk about three major things uh, what uh, what things we are improving upon what major areas that we are improving upon uh, firstly we'll talk a, talk a bit about data management uh, then we'll cover a little bit about data analysis how do you analyze the data and then on the actions and alerting if uh, if you are a user you may know in 7.7 uh, we released a new alerting framework and which we improved upon in the latest release as well so we'll cover that at the end as well what what we are doing and where we are heading on the uh, alerting piece as well uh, to begin with uh, uh, data management uh, so you you have various ingest mechanisms uh, to simplify things, we'll just uh, consider that you're collecting data from Beats platform, some some of the modules in Beats, or you've written custom Beats, uh, and uh, your aim is to push data to Elasticsearch. The aim is to index it as fast as you can. So we built Elasticsearch to be able to ingest huge huge amount of data, petabytes of data, uh, in real time, and and that was the aim. But with newer use cases, newer complexities. Uh, people wanted to manage the data that was ingested in different ways. So you have hot, warm, cold tier that we introduced some time back. Uh, and every now and then you get uh, different use cases uh, where uh, you need to store data in hot tier, you need data in warm, you need uh, cold data as well for use cases like uh, uh, fetching reports for compliances uh, or finding or doing forensics on, on old one-year-old, two-year-old data. So we we started building different data tiers hot form and code and we also added the snapshots so that you can uh, take backups of your data in elastic search and archive them as well to facilitate that hot warm cold architecture we introduced index lifecycle management as well as snapshot lifecycle management now uh, both of uh, these features are now av available in kibana you don't have to rely on curator to write scripts to move data from hot to warm, to cold, or to create snapshots. Now you can do it directly from Kibana using uh, the index lifecycle management and the snapshot lifecycle management. And uh, how do we uh, make it possible? We uh, we use aliases to a very large extent. Uh, when your data, uh, when, when indexes uh, move from one tier to different tier, uh, they get created uh, as a separate index. And how do you query different indices? How we, how we make uh, them seamless is by the use of aliases. Uh, uh, so when my index one fills up, you create an index two, you create an index three, you can write an index lifecycle policy and mention that in your Beats platform as well, in a Beats configuration file. And Elasticsearch automatically takes care of movement of data from uh, one index to another and from one tier to another. But for Kib when you're searching that data in Kibana or using any of the APIs yeah. or any any other client, uh, it's pretty seamless. How you do that? It's basically you use alias to search across different indices, search across data, across different tiers of data. Now, uh, it, it keeps on going. You keep on adding more data, uh, be it cold data, be it uh, uh, warm data or hot data. It, it, it keeps on increasing. But what we are... Uh, now coming up is uh, a new concept called data stream, uh, which abstracts the way uh, in which indices are backed up uh, and, and the different types of structure that we are working with. It, it completely abstracts it, and we are coming up with this new concept of data stream to manage that. There were issues with aliases. There were some 
request on uh, better manage to uh, better to manage aliases and to to facilitate that we have come up with a new concept of data stream which you'll come to know very soon we're launching um, uh, pretty exciting features in as part of data stream uh, you can use metadata in a smarter way to manage the complete flow of data the search queries on top of uh, different indices instead of you creating aliases or the index lifecycle policy creating those uh, uh, those aliases, it would be a much smarter way to query through all different indices. Uh, you can auto create these data streams from templates. You don't have to manually create them. You can create smart, smarter ro rollups, uh, auto creation of rollups. Rollups are very, very important, especially in metrics and uh, security kind of use cases where you want to create or um, you want to store gist of data instead of storing the entire sets of data. So Data streams facilitate smarter rollups, and it also enables smarter query routing so that uh, the queries are faster in rollups or in, in older data. We can easily or quickly query data, older data, and obviously smarter index management. You don't have to figure out where which data re resides in which index. You don't have to figure out how to create uh, different charts. Uh, what should be the chart sizes? It's it's basically a smarter index management. So that is one area that we are improving upon. Instead of aliases, we are coming up with data stream, uh, which which makes life easier, especially for hot form cold architecture where you want to store longer periods of data. Uh, then uh, jumping on to uh, uh, the warm and cold storage, uh, we. Uh, what kind of improvements we are bringing in. Obviously, why people use warm and cold, uh, basically to, to optimize their hardware costs so that they don't have to keep all the data in, uh, in SSDs or, or uh, better performing disk. That's why people move to warm and cold uh, uh, to save, save money on, uh, on, on your infrastructure, on optimizing your infrastructure. Uh, what we have done is we have improved memory usage so that you can store more amount of warm and cold data. Uh, if you have been following our releases last year, we released uh, a, a good amount of uh, heap improvement where we have uh, improved memory usage or heap usage. We have also improved disk usage as well. I'll quickly cover how it currently happens and how what kind of improvements we have done. What happens is when you create uh, uh, create an index and the index gets stored in a node, uh, it starts writing uh, to the disk, uh, the data that is present in the index. It also loads a chunk of metadata into the heap memory so that uh, it can load load that data very fast. So the search performance that you see in Kibana or using the APIs, it's because the metadata is already, already present in the heap. Now, the Many developers uh, know that Elasticsearch is memory intensive. You you need good amount of memory against uh, the kind of storage that you have against the data you are storing. Uh, so earlier, uh, I'm sorry about this. So, yep. Now what we have done is with the improvements that you are added to uh, the heap management, uh, we need less and less heap size, less and less memory uh, to, to capture all the data, to search through all the data in a faster way. Uh, the, the heap size increases. We have pushed data to file system cache so that it results in 5 to 10x less heap usage, which is pretty huge. And that's why we increase the uh, warm storage capacity on a cloud offering as well. We, we have made major improvements of the heap, uh, heap uh, utilization in Elasticsearch which is pretty huge. To give you some example, uh, earlier we had done some benchmark for storing 6 TB in disk, you need at least uh, 10 GB of heap. But with the improvements that we have done to the heap or the memory usage, now you just need 1.5 GB of heap uh, to store up to 6 TB of disk. So that's pretty huge. Uh, not just that, we are also improving on the disk usage as well. Uh, to give a perspective, when you're storing data in disk, half the data is actually part of the replicas because uh, typically any use case, you need at least one replica count to make it highly available so that you don't lose data. Uh, so at any given point of time, at least half the data is replicas. Now, what we're trying to do is in cold tier, you just keep the uh, uh, the original data in 
uh, disk and you can keep the replicas in archive or uh, you keep uh, uh, you keep simple metadata in heap so any at any point of time whatever data gets stored in in your disk it contains of meta metadata document values store fields term dictionary term proximity basically all the data that comes along with your original mapping now what we are trying to do is instead of storing everything to disk in case of frozen we'll only store the metadata as well as the doc values so instead of occupying come everything in disk uh, you can archive the entire set of data uh, using snapshots or using uh, archival storage and you just keep metadata in disk so that you get a lot of uh, a lot of available space on your frozen tier as well so now we are launching frozen tier as well pretty soon uh, which will help you to store even more amount of data in your elastic search nodes in your frozen elastic search nodes we are working on pretty exciting stuff here which coming very soon and would be available in next few releases uh, this was on the data uh, storage part we are also working on improving our querying capabilities or improving how we query data so give an example uh, if if you if you're querying data from your log files uh, when you when you run run a search query a simple search query giving an sql example what you do is uh, search data from your logs index uh, where region is ust basically from where the uh, where the data is generated and the service name is mysql these are some keywords that i used uh, and range range normalization as well what is the timestamp uh, of the data that you want to search through and uh, you can sort it by different uh, fields maybe in this scenario we are ordering it by time stamp in a uh, descending way uh, and you're limiting the search results to 20 now this is uh, how a typical query works what are the different components of the query and it uh, uh, takes time Uh, to query such uh, large amounts of data logs may be getting a lot of logs getting generated a lot of users complain that kibana uh, times out uh, elastic search is do build for speed but if you are storing hot warm cold frozen data uh, it's it's not uh, uh, normal to have queries running for 20 30 seconds so kibana times out so uh, what we are doing is Uh, to make it faster typically elastic search every field gets index uh, we build we create index index uh, indexes at right instead of index indexes at search we denormalize data we don't join them we execute them uh, in a distributed way uh, but it needs a lot of disk it needs cpu which is not the case for warm cold frozen now uh, typically if you start storing lot of data in warm cold frozen you started uh, facing errors in kibana how do we how are we planning to solve it uh, what we are uh, uh, coming up is uh, uh, you can run long running queries in kibana we have come we have actually launched this feature where you can run beyond uh, run queries beyond timeout so that they can load in the background you don't uh, get timeouts pretty common uh, error faced by different developers that uh, queries are timing out so we have come up specially for data getting stored in warm or cold or frozen we are we are uh, we are making uh, kibana to be able to access those kind of data where the queries uh, are running in a longer duration uh, you see even the dashboards uh, uh, they can run in background uh, the they can load in background as well so we are making lot of improvements not just at the query level but even at kibana level to be able to access those older data or slower data where you can easily query your frozen or cold tier data as well now possibilities uh, are uh, endless so many possibilities with these kind of features uh, if you want to find users uh, typically users only store Uh, one month or two months of data in elastic search you can start storing data as long as 12 months or two years of data uh, an example if you want to search for a user which has uh, in the last 12 months have used an application uh, which is part of a malicious app list so basically you have written a rule where you you have written a list of you have created a list of malicious apps and you want to check out which uh, 
uh, user has used those lists and which also has a param uh, with powershell.exe inside. So uh, out of this, some data can be uh, indexed, some fields might be indexed, some fields might not be indexed. Uh, you have limited join as well because it it uh, uh, it can you can only join on the index fields and something like powershell.exe uh, typically which is not currently possible because uh, we do schema on write uh, with the new features that we are introducing we are also introducing schema on read which would be which would facilitate you to start writing these queries start searching through data across year across uh, longer durations of time, years, months, or years, where you can search uh, compliance-related data, where you can search forensics-related data, basically longer tier of data. It makes it possible. So not just we are making things fast, but we are, we are uh, allowing you to search through older and older data by optimizing your infrastructure as well and, and making it available throughout the stack. So the same queries, you can run it through security app, the same app, the same queries you can uh, search in your observability as well or on your discover screen or on your logs app as well. So we are making it easier and easier for you to search, store and search longer duration of data and uh, making it as seamless as possible. So that was on the data management part. I'll quickly move on to data analysis, what kind of improvements that we are doing on the data analysis front. Uh, we we uh, typically developers use a REST APIs. This is a simple search query. Uh, it is pretty good for power users, but some developers complain, especially or analysts who come from SQL background, they complain that it's it's a new uh, query language. So what we did, we launched a, uh, SQL on top of Elasticsearch. We have a full fledged S uh, SQL interface available both on CLI as well as on REST or even in Kibana so that you can write SQL queries for querying the same type of data. We also launched KQL, which is Kibana query language to easily search through data on Kibana. Uh, basic queries with auto complete, you can easily search through data in Kibana as well. We're also launching PromQL, uh, which is basically uh, a, pr uh, a Prometheus query language uh, designed specifically for querying metrics data over time. So we are adding support from, for PromQL so that uh, once you store metrics data, you can use PromQL to search to metrics data as well. Uh, not just using APS, but even in Kibana as well. We are, we are soon launching it. We are also launching event query language, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, basically an open source uh, query language for searching through security events or any kind of events. We'll start with security events, but it would be available across different events, uh, cutting across all the entire uh, solution stack uh, and not just at the querying level we are we are making it more and more easier for you to uh, analyze data using kibana we added kibana lens uh, some 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 of the presenters today spoke about kibana lens uh, it's it's a very easy way to build your own dashboard you just drag and drop data you don't have to create bits or uh, create buckets or or pivots to create dashboards you can easily drag and drop data uh, we are also making it uh, uh, easier to build maps. Uh, yeah. Elastic has a very powerful geospatial analytics built into it. We have very powerful uh, mapping fun functionality in Kibana as well, where you can create very powerful maps and embed those maps in your dashboards as well, so that you can interact with maps along with your uh, other visualizations with, uh, within a single dashboard. And we are in, including maps in our solutions as well from maps inside Seam. We are, we are launching maps inside APM as well. Uh, it's, it's going to be embedded. So this example, you can see it's, it's a basic map functionality uh, which tracks the, uh, uh, the, the connections that are getting originated from, from, from source to destination, which is embedded in a Seam app. So we are launching such embed, embedded maps in uh, different solutions as well. And the maps, UI, the map functionality that is built to Kibana, it's, it's pretty powerful GIS functionality where you can do different kinds of analytics on top of your GIS data, uh, geospatial data. We, are, we have launched layers, we have launched different new functionalities and we'll keep on building on top of it because it's, it's core to the whole Elastic stack and it would be available across the different solutions built on top of the Elastic stack as well. 
Yeah. And uh, uh, one final feature, uh, it's it's uh, uh, dashboard is not just uh, uh, any island or uh, or a standalone dashboard itself. You can drill down to uh, other dashboards as well, easily drill down to other dashboards as well. You can link to different apps within Kibana as well. With 7.8, we launched the drill down feature and we'll keep on building on top of that drill down feature. It's pretty exciting. Uh, if you have not checked out 7.8, which was released on Thursday, I'll really request you to look at it, what new features we have added, not just in Kibana, but overall stack as well. Uh, on the last topic that I'm going to cover is actions and alerting. Uh, with uh, with the recent 7.7, .7, we, uh, we released a completely new alerting framework, which was common across uh, the, the Kibana uh, landscape, different apps in Kibana, different dashboards in Kibana, which uh, you can easily cre create alerts from different screens or from a central screen in Kibana as well. Very, very easy to create, as simple as uh, uh, creating simple thr thresholds directly from your metrics UI, from your uh, uptime UI, or from your APM UI as well. Uh, so writing simple queries, very easy to use uh, uh, queries. Uh, something like Kimana query language can be used to create those queries. And uh, 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 you can search through that data as well. We, we provide auto complete in that as well. Uh, I'll try to cover uh, the demo at the end, but yeah, it's very easy to create an alert and you can create different actions on top of it. Some out of the box uh, actions that are available today, email, create a new index, page, pager duty integration, service, service, server log, Slack, or even creating a, uh, or invoking a web hook. We are, uh, we are adding new and new uh, integrations as well. We, we have a big roadmap on the actions integration space as well. It's pretty exciting. Uh, Please stay tuned on uh, where we are heading on the actions front. Uh, and uh, what we have done is uh, uh, within an app, we have also added a small uh, task manager icon against each visualizations, uh, which using which you can quickly create alerts or create different kinds of actions on top of it. Plus, not just at Kibana, everything is exposed as an API as well. A small GIF of what can be done. Uh, uh, by clicking on, on different uh, uh, actions uh, pieces inside your app. So this is the uptime. When you click on the actions item on the uptime tab, uh, you get the, uh, you can create an alert or take an action and you can create easily uh, uh, create those alerts and take actions. In case of same, uh, it's more integrated. We have created uh, an additional integration layer called signal detection rules, which is nothing but part of the alerting framework that we have. Uh, when you create a new rule, it's pretty, uh, you can either create an alert using KQL or Lucene, or you can even create a machine learning job as well. Similarly, in case of APM, you can create alerts on top of uh, all your APM data uh, uh, or uh, basically create alerts from any kind of your app. This is the alerting, single alerting page where you can configure and enable, disable different alerts that are created across the apps, across the use cases, across the dashboards and you can get a nice overview of what's happening on the alert space as well. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the learning visualization using uh, uh, in the APM app, pretty tight integration. We're launching such tight integration across the different apps that we have, different solutions that we have. Uh, so uh, to, to summarize uh, the new features on, at the data management, data analysis, the, and the alerting piece that I covered today, are all available across all the different uh, solutions that we have. We, uh, we, we are integrating a search inside Kibana as well. Observability and security are already part of Kibana. So all the features that, that, that I spoke about, uh, not just at uh, Kibana level, but even at the Elastic level, API level, all are available across the different solutions that we have built on, built on top uh, of the Elastic stack. And they are ma making it more and more complete. Uh, they are making it more and more seamless. The roadmap that we are building on top uh, of Elastic Stack, uh, the the features that we are adding, uh, it's it's uh, to make all these solutions complete, make all these solutions turnkey. Uh, uh, that that's what I wanted to cover on uh, Elastic Stack today. Uh, thank you for attending this session. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll hand it over to Paul uh, to uh, introduce us to our next speaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, hope you have a great day ahead. Uh, over to you, Paul.
some of the, uh, the sessions there in terms of some of the, the fantastic technologies that are, that are coming from Elastic. And we're really excited about the way we can actually help to accelerate the delivery of those technologies to you as a, as a developer, as a company, as a user, um, to help you sort of embrace those, those new capabilities into your own solution offerings. You know, if I think about a lot of the, the emerging technologies that are coming out in the market today, right? And this is certainly by no means an extensive list of, of all the things you need to watch out for, but there's there's some big, big uh, changes coming in the world, right? We, we've had things such as blockchain, it's been around for a while, but that's really starting to come into the norm. AI, IoT, all these different technologies are really gonna change the way that we work, that we engage with our customers, that, uh, that, that we actually engage with each other. Um, but one of the core things, which, you know, when you think about it, these are all driven by data, right? Data is absolutely at the core to being able to actually make all of these different solutions uh, a reality in terms of what they do. And if you start thinking about the amount of data we're talking about, it's absolutely immense. I mean, you guys are working with huge amounts of data today and you're having to go ahead and actually sort through it, find the insights, being able to go ahead and actually react. And as we start to embrace some of these new technologies, that's not gonna change. And something like Elastic is absolutely critical to be able to help you find the insights and the data that you wanna to take to these new technologies to help deliver on those, uh, those new solutions and those sorts of capabilities. And so I don't need to tell you so much about, you know, all the, the capabilities that, that Elastic actually has, but certainly when it comes to being able to mine through massive amounts of data to actually get insights, uh, Elastic has an amazing stack of technologies, right? It's, it's really through all of these three core areas and certainly from what you just saw in terms of the roadmap, there's lots more that's actually uh, coming through. And so it's exciting that we're able to get access to those technologies. Now, one of the challenges is, is always about how do you go ahead and actually manage that platform? How do you actually make sure you've, uh, you're have you getting the uh, access to those new capabilities? How are you managing security and the resources you use? All of these are, are incredibly challenging. And so we're really excited about the partnership of actually having Elastic and Microsoft Azure working together to be able to bring those capabilities to you. Um, and this relationship is certainly not new, right? This is something that we've actually been working on for, for a period of time. But as we've gone through and worked closer with the Elastic team, uh, we've actually been able to work out ways to optimize the delivery of those services to you as developers on how we can actually help to make it easy for you to deploy the Elastic stack and get up and running very, very quickly. And so when you think about it, there's actually a whole range of different deployment scenarios you can actually utilize on top of Microsoft Azure. You know, starting from the bottom, you know, you can have complete control with the way you go ahead and actually deploy out the Elastic Stack. You can work out how you deploy the resources, the virtual machines, how you manage the connectivity, all of those different aspects. So if you really want that fine-grained control on the resource resources being used, you can certainly go ahead and actually do that with Elastic Stack on Azure. But then as we start to elevate through the, the different areas, um, you know, you can actually control the different levels of what levels of management, what levels of orchestration. So Elastic on Kubernetes, Elastic Cloud Enterprise gives you that, uh, that ability to um, have that orchestrated approach to the way it gets deployed, but still gives you a lot of control. And then the last one is really the Elasticsearch service, which is a full-blown managed service. And, and certainly, um, if you were getting started into deploying Elastic to the cloud, uh, this is definitely a, an approach we would actually recommend for a, a range of different people because it just takes a lot of the complexity in getting this service actually set up and lets you start getting to insights a, a hell of a lot faster. So, you know, with Elasticsearch, when you go and actually deploy this, and I'll show you the process of, of how you can actually do it and how you can maintain it, um, it gives you the ability to create the Elasticsearch service very, very quickly, gets Kibana up and running. We actually have now have eight regions uh, deployed globally. I think the latest one um, was in Paris, which <laughs> may not work so well for, for this particular region, but certainly here in Asia Pacific, we have regions represented. Um, the great thing about this, which I really love, is that you, know, you are able to leverage the expertise from both Microsoft architects and Elastic architects to make sure that 
when you deploy these services, they're secure and compliant out of the box, right? You don't have to sit there and, and go through every uh, individual aspect and every single switch. You can sort of rest assured that the, the industry's experts are actually working on uh, on these deployments. And so, you know, making sure that they're optimized straight away. So again, you know, faster time to uh, insights and results from your, uh, your data. Uh, and the other thing as well, you can always get the uh, the latest technologies, right? And I know that that 7.8, I think, just came out the other day. Um, you can actually see how we we can uh, manage the, the deployments of different versions in the uh, the Elastic uh, space. So I used to be a developer. I still cut code every now and again. This is me as a hardcore developer. You can tell because I've got a sweatband on, um, a little more facial hair these days. But uh, but as a developer, it was always a challenge to get access to cool technologies, right? You, you were typically um, tied to what your organization actually had, what the actual uh, technologies that were made available to you on your, your desktop. And we didn't really have laptops back when I was coding. I feel really old now. <laughs> but, you know, this approach with Azure really helps you to, to really go ahead and actually spin up these services quickly, um, start trialing them out with the full functionality and then be able to demonstrate the value to your organization of, of what you can actually do. So what I wanted to do was actually spend a little more, bit more time demonstrating that capabilities and how it actually works rather than just sort of taking you through slides. So what I'm going to do here is uh, is switch over to um, my environment here. Now, this this here you can actually see. This is a the first time you'd actually go into Elastic.co. Uh, once you've logged in, you can go ahead and actually start, you know, creating the the deployments you actually need for your Elastic service. So I just simply need to go here and click Start Your Free Trial. And what you can see here is a very straightforward approach, right? So give a name for your deployment. We can call this one uh, Matt Test Two. Right, I can choose your cloud platform. So I would obviously recommend that Azure is uh, definitely the platform you want to go and use. And you can see the uh, the different regions we actually have that you can go ahead and deploy to. And I'm here in Singapore, so I'm going to choose the Southeast Asia Singapore region. Here we can actually go and set up our deployment. So you can see by default, we use the latest version of Elastic, but if your application requires it or your, your need is uh, is very specific, you can certainly go through and choose the, uh, the different version you actually want to go in and use. Finally, we can actually go through and choose the, the particular type of configuration that you would need based on your, your application or, or specific requirements. Um, and so you can see all of these, these different architectures. And as I said, the benefit here is that these are all optimized for those particular workloads. So, you know, the, the Elastic team, the Microsoft team has sort of come together to actually really look at what configurations you need to make this, uh, this possible. Um, and so if you click on that, you can actually see the, uh, the specifications of each of those different deployments, right? So it's very, very clear as to what's actually going on. The great thing is you don't need to know how to go ahead and actually do that. It'll take care of it itself. And once that's done, if I choose one of those workloads, I can certainly go through and then click, you know, create deployment. Now I won't do that now because it does take a little bit of time and we only have a, a short time together today. I just want to flick over to a deployment which we already have and this is this is for my uh, my mat test. We had mat test two in our demo, but this is mat test one. Um, you can actually see when I deployed this, it was actually version seven point seven point one. And so I've been given the option here to go ahead and actually upgrade. And so if I click on that, it's going to go through all the components and actually upgrade them to the latest version, right? So it's a fairly straightforward process. You can actually see the applications that are deployed. So we've got Elasticsearch, we've got Kibana, we've got APM all ready to go. Um, we'll launch into Kibana in a second. You can have a look. And then you can actually see all of the different instances which are, are being deployed here. And the great thing about this is because we've deployed this to the cloud, we've actually made sure that we deploy them to availability zones for high availability. So, you know, if there's ever a problem, you can also go ahead and actually have them uh, uh, being distributed across the, uh, the different zones. Now, if, for example, you kind of felt like you needed to tune these up a little bit more beyond the actual uh, uh, prescribed architectures, which have been done by uh, by Elastic and Microsoft. It's very easy to go into any one of these instances and actually click on edit configuration. 
And once I'm in here, what I can actually do is use a very simple slider to actually change things like the RAM. I can see what that actually impacts. I can see the fault tolerance that's actually available. Um, I can go through and actually enable a whole range of, of different configurations inside my Elastic deployment. So um, as I'm going ahead and actually doing that, I get an update as to what's happening on the side in the summary here. So I can see what's being consumed for each of the different resources. So you know, even though we, we would say that these deployments are configured around best practices, you certainly have the flexibility to be able to go ahead and actually alter them based on your, your workload need. So um, pretty impressive from that point of view. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. And what I want to do is to jump into Kibana. So as soon as you actually got this deployed, everything is, uh, is pretty much up and running. And so if I go into the Kibana area here, uh, we'll let that load up. You know, the whole capability of, of Kibana is actually available to me. Let me just make this a little bigger. There we go. Um, and so all the capabilities of Kibana that you're used to in terms of your on-prem deployments, uh, are all available here, right? So one of the things I actually did when I actually uh, created this deployment was I went to kaggle.com and actually downloaded some data sets to go ahead and actually play with. And look, I'll be the first to uh, be honest, I am not an Elasticsearch expert, but the fact that this was able to help me deploy this very, very quickly um, and then get up and running on some data and start seeing the power of what you could do, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's a pretty exciting technology. And so uh, what I did with Kaggle was I took down the, uh, the Netflix information. And so, you know, I just uploaded it as a CSV. I can actually see all the information here. I can very quickly go ahead and actually create those sort of visualizations to see things such as, you know, dates that movies were added and things like that. So, you know, from a, a, a development point of view, you know, if you ever considered actually trying to get up and running on Elastic in your applications or wanted to be able to go ahead and actually try new things, this is a fantastic approach, right? You're able to get access to um, a majority of the, uh, the functionality very, very quickly to be able to go ahead and actually validate some of the applications you're building, um, some of the scenarios that you want to go ahead and actually try out. And it's just really easy to do. Now, one of the things that I wanted to sort of add in just quickly as we go into the demo was, you know, once you actually have this up and running, you can act, use it with a whole range of different tools. You know, Elastic and Kibana is absolutely fantastic for those visualizations. Um, one of the things that we see a lot is um, developers who use different sorts of tool sets. Um, and one of the tool sets we have is Visual Studio Code, which is, is probably if you sort of read the uh, developer surveys from, uh, from Stack Overflow, Visual Studio Code is pretty much one of the most popular development tools for, for open source in the industry. And so what I actually did was um, inside Visual Studio Code, I can actually go and download all these different extensions that, that ease the development process for me uh, in terms of different aspects and applications. And one of those is actually an extension for Elastic. And so um, one of the developers in the community has actually built out an Elasticsearch developer tool. And so what that does is it brings in a lot of the, uh, um, the semantics and, and the capabilities of Elastic inside the tool. So you can go ahead and actually write queries, test them out, have a look at the results and things like that just within the tool itself. So when you have a very complicated application with lots of different uh, projects and components, you can actually have that together in one space. So if I go over here, what I actually have is a, uh, a connection to my Elastic environment, right, which is what you, you saw me actually showcase just before. So the host and the actual name. If I click on here and say, set as my target environment, and I can then go ahead and actually ping this to make sure it's up and running. So ping environments. I can see down the bottom, I've got an okay, so that's working. And then I can go down here into my queries and actually write these different queries, right? So I can actually see here, here's a query for a simple get all. Here's a query for a get by the, uh, the rating of the TV show. So if I wanted to run this query, I just have to go up here and click run query. And I can see all of the different results here, right? All listed out nicely for me. If I wanted to run the, uh, the one with the filter, I can do the same thing here and I'm getting the, the different sets of results. 
And if I wanted to start writing another query, what I really love about this is kind of like the IntelliSense to be able to actually go through and uh, and write those queries, right? So if I go through and type in Netflix, you can see underscore search, right? And then we can open up the brackets and I can type in here query, right? So as I'm going ahead and actually doing this, it's actually filling out all of the text for me. So it really helps me to, to make sure I'm actually writing the right sort of uh, uh, you know, script and language to be able to go ahead and actually write those queries. So, you know, the, the power of actually combining the Elasticsearch services, Kibana, um, running on Azure to be able to get you access to that functionality, being able to use different tool sets to, uh, to go ahead and actually work with those, uh, that information. It's an incredibly powerful partnership. And, and once you bring in the community, and I, I heard the conversation talking before about the community being a very, very big, big part of the, the, elastic, uh, uh, the elastic world, it's the same thing at Microsoft. I mean, the work that people are doing in the community to add value to the tools and the platforms, this is just a great demonstration of where that, uh, that, that I guess, that triangle of, of value actually starts to come together. So, you know, we're really excited about this relationship and how it's starting to pan out. So let me just quickly go back and we'll finish off the slide. So I know people are keen to get into the, uh, the questions and answers section. Um, one of the big things that, that Elastic does obviously very, very well is on observability. Uh, and what we're making sure we do is that when you actually create a Azure deployment, um, you have that observ observability built in. So um, you want to be able to go ahead and observe and monitor what's going on in your Azure environment. You can certainly go ahead and actually do that. So you can actually see on the right-hand side a whole range of, uh, of different aspects of, uh, of Azure. You can go ahead and actually monitor. You've got the dashboards, which are already built up. In fact, um, you can actually see an example here of some of the different views in terms of what data is actually being captured directly into Kibana to make it easy as possible for you to, uh, to get those insights and see how things are actually performing. The other area we touched on briefly was around um, Azure and running uh, Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes, right? So um, if that was really your thing and you wanted to be able to go ahead and actually use Kubernetes for deployment, that's you know a perfectly acceptable scenario. You can go ahead and actually do that through uh, um, pre-created uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, environments. You can get them deployed, get the logs up and running, everything works, and then you can actually have that all deployed um, via the command line. So if you wanted to actually use the, uh, the command line to go ahead and actually uh, write this, um, it's a fairly straightforward process, right? I can go ahead and use YAML to actually start to deploy um, those configurations into my environment, uh, get them up and running on, uh, on Azure very, very quickly. Uh, and again, you know, the time to, uh, to getting insights and, uh, and data is uh, greatly accelerated from, uh, from that point of view. Definitely to go ahead and actually prove the capabilities that Elastic will actually enable for you. So with that, we just want to sort of say thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Uh, we're really excited about what we're doing together with Elastic to bring these capabilities to you. Um, definitely lots of features and capabilities that you can take advantage of with Elastic on Azure. Um, lots of different ways to go ahead and deploy as we talked about from the Elastic stack where you really control it all the way up to a complete managed service. Uh, we would just encourage you to be able to go ahead and actually try it out. And you can start doing that by going to uh, elastic.co. So with that, Paul, that was a, a whirlwind sort of tour around Elastic on uh, Azure. I'm hoping that was uh, useful and informative and uh, we're definitely here to help everybody out. No, that was excellent, Matt. We really uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. And I think we're really hitting stride with our partnership with, uh, with Microsoft and Asia Pacific and globally for that matter. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Okay, it's Q and A time. We've uh, we've come sort of to the end of today. So now's the fun part. Maybe you can stump some of our uh, engineers here. So let me uh, let me just go onto the channel to see what questions may be rolling in. Can we easily join disparate data sets from APM monitoring, etc., at different aggregate levels to form the unified data model? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go, Paul. Yeah, we can we can peel it from uh, quite easily from logs to metrics to APM. 
because of um, the feature called Elastic Common Schema and all the metadata we're collecting uh, throughout the ingest layer that links to data in different indices together. So it's quite easy to do between APM traces um, logged from a particular Kubernetes pod to metrics and logs that this particular pod produced. Um, they effectively all have the same commonly named field containing the that pod's unique ID value. For example, that's one example where you know metadata and elastic common schema are being used together. So that's how we can uh, we can link all the pieces of data observability that are in the cluster together. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um, another one here. Is Elastic Security trying to replace traditional antivirus? Anyone want to take a stab? Yeah, I'll take that one, Paul. Thanks. Lawrence, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, it's not. I mean, it includes the traditional antivirus and malware protection, but on top of that, it's allowing a more sophisticated approach uh, based on behavioral attacks. Uh, it, it's actually mapped to the MITRE attack framework, which if you if you don't know what that is, is a globally accessible knowledge base of adversary tactics and techniques uh, observed in the real world. Well, then uh, Elastic is uh, adhering to that. Elastic Security is, is sort of implementing that. And this really allows the security analysts to do threat hunting, uh, not only on your single device, but across your whole network and infrastructure to really find out you know, where their attacks are coming from and who they're coming from. Okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, Lawrence. Let's see if we can get another one here. How does Elastic Observability compare slash complement with App Dynamics? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, that's one of my favorites. So uh, how we how we um, how we compete with them actually. So first and foremost, we have Elastic APM, which is so far the only vendor-backed open source and free solution. For, for application performance monitoring. Um, yeah, it's it's quite a big technical differentiator because it puts the tool in a lot of, you know, in a lot of people's hands that, that are able to apply the tools to their problems, whether it's, you know, they have a commercial a relationship with Elastic or not. That's a big differentiator that greatly enhances our user base. Um, the other difference is uh, the fact that we actually solve observability with logs, metrics, and APM, not just APM. So we provide a more complete um, observability solution um, compared to traditional APM vendors that typically do application performance monitoring and, and sometimes metrics. Um, yeah, so we also have, uh, when, when people decide to have a commercial relationship with, um, with Elastic, we have a resource-based uh, pricing model, which doesn't really penalize um, your architectures, so we don't really, we're not going to charge you based on how many agents you deploy or, you know, uh, which environments you're using as, as in, we charge you based on the sort of resource utilization. So you, you're in control of your spend, so to speak, with Elastic, which allows you to kind of, it frees you up to make your own architectural choices without necessarily being, being dictated by, by your vendor relationships. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it looks like we've got one here for um, Matt at Microsoft, if you're still with us. Can this Elasticsearch service be enabled on existing Azure private cloud subscriptions? Are there any, uh, are there any more regions planned in Azure, say Australia East and Southeast? Yeah, so so for the first the first question, um, you can definitely go ahead and actually deploy the Elastic Stack to an existing environment. So if you go into um, the Azure portal, there is definitely the ability to deploy Elastic through that that portal there. So if you already have a um, existing Azure subscription, you've set up a lot of your other infrastructure. That's a, a fairly straightforward process um, to be able to actually deploy that. You probably then go into more of the self-managed Elastic stack at that point of view. The Elastic.co site is actually uh, more uh, more managed by the actual teams between Elastic and Azure from that angle. But certainly, you have an existing Azure subscription you should be okay. Um, in terms of uh, of new regions, yeah, look, we'll we will continue to sort of go ahead and actually roll them out. Um, I think when we gave the session with Elastic in uh, December last year, I think we said we had six six availability zones that were deployed. We're now up to eight. So the most recent one was uh, was Paris. Um, I don't have exact dates, but certainly we're continuing to roll that out um, as it goes. And so, you know, if uh, if it is something that that's really important. 
uh, please bang on Microsoft stores, bang on Elastic stores, and, and we'll see if we can try and accelerate some of those deployments. Well, I definitely uh, know that, that Yeah, it was, it was, no, that was it. Those were two questions, right? <laughs> it was a question if I missed one, but that's, yeah, that's it. Thanks. I definitely know that Australia is coming soon and we're looking very forward to it because uh, the demand is there. So uh, hopefully a, a few months away. Um, Super. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that, Matt. Let me just go back. I think there was one more question that came in off of Michael's um, last response here. Um, please describe Elastic's pricing model. How is it different to its competitors? Okay, so Michael touched on this a little bit before. So previously, with all the different deployment options that we've got, you know, with our cloud, obviously you get charged based on the amount of memory and storage that's there. Um, we used to have on-premise just standard nodes and we charge per node that are in production. Um, but essentially now we're moving to a full resource-based pricing model. So aligned to the memory footprint. So Michael touched on it before for say enterprise search or search, a lot of those companies will charge based on how many searches um, or for observability um, or, or APM. A lot of people will charge for how many hosts they have, say Dynatrace or AppDynamic will charge on by how many hosts. And then for security, for SAM or, or for endpoint, uh, you know, those vendors will charge for how many endpoints they're detecting and protecting. Um, uh, for us, um, it doesn't matter. You can be have a million endpoints that you're pulling from or, you know, a million hosts. It's all based on the data that's ingested into Elastic. And we've done this over time as we've acquired new companies, um, APM or security. It will always be that way. It's based on the memory footprint that's within um, the platform. So that one same single tool chain to pull down those different capabilities. In there and so that's a, that's effectively how the the pricing model will work and it's great for a lot of our customers and we're seeing a lot more customers build out managed services with our technology at its core that means that our pricing model is linear and it's transparent and they can see that as they grow and their product grows and scales what the cost will bear and they can they can sort of plan for that so if you have an additional questions around that around the specific use cases we'd be happy to pick that up on a separate thread. So um, let's see here. Here's one, one last one. Any specific certification concentrating on elastic security rather than individual courses? Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that one, Paul. Thanks. <clears throat> Apologize for my audio before as well. Um, we don't have that currently on the certification examinations. We, we have the... Elastic Certified Engineer, Elastic Certified Analysts, that's for your sort of business users who are looking at data visualizations and analysts on a Kibana. Um, and then the new one, which is the Elastic Certified Observability Engineer. But it's a good question. Uh, I think we'll take that to the training team. I know they're revamping a lot of the, the courses at the moment um, with respect to threat hunting and using Elastic Security and, and SIM. But you know, look, look out for that one over the next six months, we'll, we'll take that up with the training team. Good question. Okay, I'm looking to see if there's any more questions. I think a lot of them were, uh, were answered during the session and I don't see any other outstanding questions here. When will we see the next webinar meeting for Asia regions again? Good question. And uh, you're reading my mind. I'll get to that very shortly. Um, so I'll come back to that. Um, any other questions that we might see here? No. Okay. Well, listen, with that, um, we hope this was a good, uh, you know, three and a half hours of your time. Uh, we really do appreciate there were, you know, several thousands uh, of you that did uh, respond and attend with us today. So thank you again for for joining us. If we weren't able to get to your questions, uh, please make sure to hit up your local team so you can take a screenshot of this or take a photo. Um, this will come straight through to our user success team. 
and they can sort of filter your questions and make sure the right specialist will be able uh, to address them. Uh, so please feel free to send those through. Also two recordings of this session uh, will be emailed through to all the reg registrants within the next few days. And we'll break those down even to the individual um, speakers there. And as I had mentioned through the, um, through the event, we are going to have Elasticon observability on July 23rd. That's next month. So, you know, just like Grab shared their use case today, we know that there are several of you across the region. We would love to hear your story as well. If this would suit um, with observability, we'd love to have a chat with you to see if you might be able to share it with the community or if for any of the other use cases for that matter, uh, we'll be running those in the upcoming months as well. So um, please stay tuned. We will uh, get these invites out shortly. Um, so with that said, uh, thank you everyone. We re really appreciate it and um, we'll see you next time.